The Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21, verse 5 through 19. While some people were speaking about how the temple was adored with costly stones and votive offerings, Jesus said, All that you see here, the days will come when there will not be left a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. Then they asked him, Teacher, when will this happen? And what sign will there be when all things are about to happen? He answered, See that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has come. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for such things must happen first, but it will not immediately be the end. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famines, and plagues from place to place, and sights and mighty signs will come from the sky. Before all this happens, however, they will seize and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and to the prisons, and they will have you led before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. Remember, you are not to prepare your defense beforehand, for I myself shall give you a wisdom in speaking that all your adversaries will be powerless to resist or refute. You will even be handed over by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will be destroyed. By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time Come follow me. Discipleship Reflections on the Sunday Gospel for Liturgical Year C by Daniel H. Muggenberg Our scripture passage for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 5 through 19. In this passage, Jesus prepares his disciples for the future by giving them a set of cautions so that they will not be surprised when the certain necessary events come to pass. People oftentimes interpret this passage as a reference to the end times. However, in Luke's gospel, it relates more to particular events in the life of the early church during the first century AD. Even though we live in the midst of very difficult historical circumstances, this passage offers important guidance for us as well. Jesus offers his teaching in response to the crowds who were marveling at the beauty of the temple. For them, a building had become the focus of their faith Jesus cautions them to base their faith upon what is eternal than the temporal beauty of the physical structure. Their faith should be rooted in a deep commitment to Him and the Gospel. It is possible for Christians to focus their faith on temporal or ornamental things as well. Religious things don't make us faithful Christians. Sometimes religious buildings can actually become a distraction of faith when we too marvel at their beauty but fail to grow more deeply in committed discipleship and when a faith community spends more resources on maintenance than on mission, the greatest and most inspiring moments in Christianity are the lives of holy men and women rather than buildings or art. The distracted faith of the crowds remind us that there are a variety of ways in which we can place our faith in wrong things. It is important to periodically reflect 
on the frequency with which we allow our attention to be dominated by institutions, achievements, health, beauty, pleasure, relationships, bank accounts, and so forth. All these things have the potential to become false gods in our lives when we give them greater attention than we give to our relationship with God. All these things, like the temple building in Jerusalem, are temporal and do not last. Eventually, they fail us, disappoint our hope, and their lasting value and enduring importance. This disillusionment is actually a healthy process of recognizing ways in which we have misplaced our faith so that we can affirm, reaffirm the importance of our relationship with God and direct our energy and attention into that enduring reality. Reflection Questions in what ways can religious things actually distract us from the person of Jesus and the message of the gospel today? How can religious things help facilitate your relationship with Christ? How do you know when your attachment to religious thing has become spiritually unhealthy? What can we do to ensure that our service to the gospel is about mission and not just maintenance? What are some of the other false gods in which people mistakenly place their trust? How have you experienced the purifying effect of disillusionment and disappointment? The next teaching Jesus offers the disciples is a set of cautions. The first caution is to not be deceived. He assures us that there will be those who make two fundamental claims. I am he and the time is near. Both of these claims are significant. When someone makes the claim, I am he, then they are seeking to become the false God of our lives. When someone claims that the time is near, then they are wanting to interpret our life experience for us in a way contrary to the gospel. No matter what age we live in, there are always people who try to take the place of God. God alone is the one who can give us our true identity, our inherent value, and has the plan for our lives that will lead us to eternal happiness and peace. There are lots of other people and agencies that try to tell us who we are and what should we be our values and priorities. Certainly those same agencies seek to tell us what will make us happy. The caution of Jesus that we should not be deceived by those who try to make themselves the God of our lives is as important today as it is 2,000 years ago. So, too, there are always people who are eager to interpret our experience for us as to motivate our response in the direction they desire rather than the direction God wills. The forces of a secular society try to interpret our experience in the absence of faith that leads to despair, hedonism, fear, and relativism. Disciples are called to interpret the experience of their lives in the light of faith that trust in God's love, mercy, and providence. Without this faith-filled interpretation of our everyday situations, we can become misled and can act in faithless ways. In these moments, too, Jesus cautions us, do not be deceived. The second caution Jesus gives is that we should not be afraid. The events Jesus has described, wars, earthquakes, uprisings, and so forth, can be terrifying for those without faith. Disciples are called to trust in God as the Lord of history and to have confidence that whatever takes place 
even calamities, are part of God's will. The proper response for a disciple is not fear, but faithful action. Because these events are permitted by God, they are meant to be the means of our salvation. When there is persecution, suffering, and violence, then people are called to witness perseverance, compassion, and forgiveness. Disciples who witness in this way will have even greater hope for the coming of the kingdom of God and welcome our Lord's return, not fear it. Reflection questions. How do false prophets in our world today try to take the place of God by telling us who we are, what gives us worth, or what is the meaning of our lives? What is their message? How do you see others responding to the message of false prophets? And what is the effect in their lives? What are some of the situations families face today that are being interpreted in ways contrary to Christian teaching? What does it feel like to stand up against the false prophets of our time and reject their misinterpretation of our professional and personal challenges? When are you afraid because of the news you receive in the media? How can faith change the way you receive bad news so that it becomes an opportunity for discipleship and witness? The final teaching of Jesus concerns the inevitability of Christian suffering. The disciples asked for signs so that they could be could have advance warning of coming difficulties in order to avoid them. Jesus doesn't grant their request for information about signs because discipleship is about saving one's life. That is, avoiding the sufferings and persecutions of being a Christian. Rather, discipleship calls us to faithful and patient endurance in the face of challenges. The faithful and patient endurance is what saves us. Salvation for a disciple means being so committed to Jesus that we would be willing to accept even death to witness him. The encouragement for patience and endurance in suffering was important for Christians of the first century who were facing the first persecutions. For disciples, moments of persecution are seen as opportunities for witness. We see in the early church responding to persecution in this way in the Acts of the Apostles. Reflection questions. Who are examples of faithful perseverance that inspire you? When has your faith or discipleship been challenged and were you prepared for it? Do you pray more to avoid challenges or to perseverance faithfully through challenges? What current moments of challenge can be opportunities for your witness? Lastly, Jesus offers the disciples all these teachings so that they will know what's coming and be prepared for it. He wants them and us to prepare now so we can faithfully endure the future. By doing so, we will bear witness to the power and presence of Jesus in our lives. That's discipleship. All we have to do is look around to see what kinds of challenges people face in their lives. Although the situations may differ from person to the next, the basic challenges remain the same for everyone. By knowing what challenges are taking place in other people's professional, family, marital, and personal lives, we can better prepare ourselves to face those challenges in our own lives. 
The time to prepare is now. If we are not preparing now, then we will not be prepared when the time comes. Reflection questions. What are the challenges people face in their marriages? What are some of the challenges people face in their families in raising their children? What are the challenges people face in their personal lives?